And any day that the general manager of the Las Vegas Raiders comes to our beautiful studio here is a good day. Uh, Dave Ziegler, we were talking, we are approaching the one-year anniversary of you and Josh getting this gig. I think we're about two and a half weeks out. So going back, thinking about these first 360-some-odd days, what do you think the biggest thing that you've learned going through this now process of, of year one? Yeah, I've learned quite a few things. Um, I think, you know... One thing that I think I've learned uh, during this time is in this specific role is just how important your ability to prioritize tasks are. And sometimes that means prioritizing on the move and like in the moment too, um, because your days um, your your days can take a lot of you know a lot of different shapes and forms. And so some of it's prioritizing in terms of just your day and and what you need to handle as a general manager, whether it's roster management decisions versus watching tape versus meeting with the player development department. You know, there's all these different things, and and really honing in on like what's important now. Is is something that's hard to prepare for in, until you're really in it, and then I also think prioritizing kind of you know when you're um, you know you you play a game on Sunday you have a few injuries prioritizing you know how you're going to a- attack that how you're gonna who's gonna come in for workouts how you're gonna fill those roles and um, and the order of doing things so I just a lot of a lot of just prioritizing because there are such a wide range of things that come your way and and and, and that's something. Um, something I've gotten a lot better at. I knew it was going to be something that was going to be challenging uh, before I took the job. And so it's it it's definitely is, but it's something that I've gotten better at. But it's um, I've learned a lot of lessons in terms of how to do it better um, throughout the year. I imagine there's a lot of kind of the logistical aspect too that you kind of have to learn on the fly. Obviously, being in New England and having the experience there, you get a chance to see it and feel it. But I imagine it's a little bit different in terms, like you brought up, the workouts and how guys are getting from the airport to the facility and things like that that are just different and and kind of carry a different weight when you're the guy sitting in the big chair. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Even the time difference, yeah, uh, oh, yeah. makes an impact um, in terms of travel, especially east, to, you know, east to west or west to east. There, that was all. That was a new experience. The waiver wire um, comes out at one thirty. I'm used to the waiver wire coming out between four thirty and five thirty, and my day being structured a little bit around you know that that opportunity. So yeah, there's some little intricate things too um, that are that are new um, and that are different that 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 do impact how you prioritize your day and kind of how you schedule out your day. West Coast time is the best though. Yeah, West. West I mean Monday night football at five thirty instead of eight thirty. Come no, on, no doubt. Can't Especially argue for that. The, the early birds like me, who like I got to be in bed by eight thirty. So there's <laughs> no way I'm even watching a game if if we're kicking off at yeah. You have to have a certain amount of mental toughness yeah. on the East Coast to. to to, you know, go wire to wire on, on some of those games that are ending at midnight. The the, uh, the NBA Finals is the worst because oh. those start at 930 on the oh. East Coast. And when the Cavs were in it, you know, I grew up a, a Cavs fan, obviously. But when the Cavs were in it, I, I was drinking coffee at 930 at tip off just to stay up and watch the game. So the West Coast, uh, in terms of sports viewing, no doubt about it. So I'm a West Coast guy through and through, man. There's yeah. a lot of things to love about the West Coast. But like I said, the, uh, the time for, for premier programming is one of them. But, you know, just before we kind of move on and kind of wrap up year one for you. I mean, are there any surprises? I, I imagine there are that kind of come through going, you know, through year one. But when you think of things that maybe surprise you in a pleasant way or surprise you, in, oh, this is something I need to adjust into year two. What are, what are the ones that come to mind? Yeah, I, I do think I was pretty well prepared um, to handle a lot of like, you know, the, the job in terms of what some of the anticipating what some of the surprises were, because there had been so many of my predecessors in New England that had opportunities to go to be GMs and just some of the people that I'm close with in the league too, um, Terry Fontenot in Atlanta, for example, where I, I did get to pick a lot of people's brains that were, um, you know, coworkers or friends that um, were able to explain to me a lot of the, you know, a lot of the surprises, um, you know, so... I didn't have, you, you know, I didn't have a ton of surprises. I would say the one thing is, is just the amount of time that um, your day can get eaten up by a lot of non, maybe football scouting based tasks or issues, um, whether it's a player issue, whether it's a staff issue, whether it's an organizational issue. Um, and I'm not saying all negative things, just different things that come up that that can eat up your time. And I don't think you can ever be really prepared for um, how much of that comes up because everybody that almost everybody that comes into a GM role is a scout. 
And most of your days are spent watching film. Most of your days are centered around just scouting. And then you get into this role and a lot of your days eaten up by all non-scouting activities. Again, whether it's roster management stuff, whether it's meeting with the head coach on um, whether it's a player issue or, you know, preparing for an opponent or some scheme things or just, you know, various, various things that pop up. And so I think the surprise is, again, it wasn't a, a necessarily a big surprise, but just the amount of things that come up that don't pertain to scouting that you have to handle, I think was a surprise. I wouldn't say, and, and I don't think this is a surprise, but I want to go back to your first question, if you don't mind, just of in terms of the lessons learned. I think the one thing that that I always knew was important, um, just from a team building standpoint, but I really uh, saw this this um, really became evident this year, is how valuable it is to have smart and dependable players on your team. And when I say smart, I mean talking about from a football IQ standpoint. I don't think you can have enough of them. And I think a lot of times talent's important. There's no doubt. Explosiveness, speed. Um, the ability to tackle, the ability to rush the passer, like all of that's really important. But having players that are smart and dependable that also have that skill set. So in the critical moments of games, um, they they can take what you they were taught during the week. They can take from the practice field the, in those critical situations, end a half, two minute drill, uh, f- last four minutes of the game, whatever it may be, that they can take those and execute those in the moment and have the, I would say the football intelligence to take it again from the meeting rooms in the field to the game. Even though we may only spend, we may have only spent because of the way it works, we may have spent 10 minutes on a certain topic. But the expectation is if it pops up in the game, that specific situation, boom, you can, you can, um, you can um, execute the task that you need to that you need to execute. And, and I think that um, you know, that's an area we're going to continue to improve. We have a lot of guys that have that, but we're going to continue to improve in that area. But I think everybody's always focused in on again, the, um, the the measurables and the athletic testing numbers and things of that nature. But I don't think you can have enough smart and dependable football players. And I just think that, again, I understood that, but I didn't, till I got in this role and, and really saw it day in and day out and was really intimately involved in, I'd say, the team more so than the past, I really saw the value of that. How do you and the staff, and you know, I'm talking about your staff, Josh staff, the collective staff, evaluate something like that? Because you know, for, for the guy like me, height, weight, speed, I mean, that's pretty easy to see, to identify, yeah. to understand, to make sense of. With some of the things that you're talking about, the the intelligence, the, the football IQ, the emotional intelligence, I imagine, in some ways, mm-hmm. how do you kind of gauge that going through an offseason process as we get ready for the draft and free agency and all that comes in the next couple of months? Yeah, it's the most. It's one of the most difficult parts of the um, the pre-draft process. If we're just focusing on the draft right now, free agency is a little bit of a different animal. Um Part of that process starts in the fall as we go into schools. Um, our, our area scouts go into schools all across the country, and they start to do their character and their character research and their background information. And they talk to you know a lot of the different people that are in those schools to try to um, get some of those questions answered when it comes to football intelligence. And I'm not going to go into the specifics, but there's specific questions that we would ask to uncover those things. There's um, uh, and, and so there's that aspect. And then it's kind of you're piecing those puzzle pieces together now um, at all these different events. And what I mean by those different events is now we're out of the fall scouting process. And so we do have a feel of it. Mm-hmm. Um, for some guys, we're in lockstep. We know exactly what it is. And then for some guys, good or bad. And then for some guys, it's uh, it's an open-ended question. We we th- we have heard one thing, but then there's this other thing and you, and you really don't know. So now we're in the all-star game phase where we get to sit down and interview players. And so, um, and then the combine and then 30 visits and pro days and all of those different things. And we have a certain f- a certain formula and a f- certain philosophy here when we meet individually with players, uh, a process that we put them through to understand exactly what their football intelligence is to the best that we can. And then um, obviously you have to make decisions um, weighing the, um, cause you still have to play football too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we're, we have to weigh the, the you know, the, what position they play because each position requires a different level, I would say of football intelligence. And so you have to weigh what the position is. You have to weigh the talent of the player. And then the other thing that you have to weigh is the makeup of your current room. And, and what I mean by that is if you have a really young room um, where I would say maybe there's players that are still growing from both a an emotional intelligence standpoint, uh, a football IQ standpoint, a maturity standpoint, um, 
Is that a room that you can take a risk on another player that maybe has some of those same issues? Or do you have to fill that position? Uh, maybe it's in free agency with a veteran that you know has those attributes that can help bring the room along. So there's a little bit of understanding your room too when you're getting into kind of weighing the um, the pros and cons of adding a player in in in, in that uh, in that regard. You know, I you know I've talked about this a bunch. It's a people business, right? At the end of the day, it's a people business. But you know. We heard from Josh for really the last time this regular season, kind of putting a bow on 2022 on Monday, and, and he talked a lot about the evaluation and the process that go that we're going to go through for the next couple of weeks and months. And so for the casual fan out there who, who says like, yeah, okay, we're going through the process, but what does that process of evaluation look like for you, you and the guys over the next couple of weeks? Yeah. And, and, and again, I don't want to, you know, spill sure. a lot of the specifics of what we do, but I would say, um, and, I, and I'll get into some, but I would say in a general sense, what we look at and when 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 we look at i'm going to take the players out of it for a minute mm -hmm. when we look at okay from a coaching perspective um whether it's you know practice whether it's travel to away games whether it's prep just game preparation from a scouting standpoint um our pro scouting process we do advanced scouting reports where we scout our previous opponent those types of things our college our fall scouting process whatever it may be athletic training, what the athletic training staff does, what strength and conditioning did during the year, so on and so forth. The thing that we go through in a very basic sense without getting the specifics is what went well, mm -hmm. what didn't go well, and what are what are the solutions to the things that didn't go well? And some of those things may come back on me or could come back on Josh. What I mean by that is there, there may be a, a communication gap that I didn't communicate well enough to, let's just say, our strength and conditioning uh, um, department. And in that evaluation process where we meet individually with all those different groups, um, those are the, some of the things that are going to come up. Hey, one thing that we had an issue with was X, Y, and Z. The solution we felt was, you know, the solution that we felt that would correct this was better communication on your end you know, to, to do X, Y, and Z. Sure. And what we try to do is create a, an environment here where um, I want the people that work for me to also feel comfortable to be critical with me in areas that what I want to improve. And, and Josh is the same way. And so a lot of it is looking internally about all of those different things. When we're looking at the players specifically, um, we're, we're, we're looking at the strengths and weaknesses. And then for the weaknesses, it's, it's a really, it's a specific plan for the player of what they need to do to get better in these certain areas. It could be something as basic as flexibility. And we and us giving them a plan, not just saying, hey, you need to yeah. you need to get more flexible or you need to uh, you know get stronger. It's spe it's specific of the how. Mm -hmm. How are you going to do it? And this is how we're going to help you do it, you know, so on and so forth. So in, in a basic sense, that's what it is. It's not just talk and it is a process and it does take time and it does take um, you know, patience to do it the right way. Um, but that's what we're going to do. And we're you, you, even in areas that we thought went well, we're going to do the, the, the same thing in the areas that we, that, that went well as, as long as the areas that we struggled in. Yeah. And, and I think we, we talk about the kind of sounds like that holistic approach to evaluation and understanding, you know, individualized plans for indiv individualized players while also Correct. understanding they're one of 90, right? And the 90 collectively has to move as one. Uh, you and I, I'm sure are going to talk many times over the next couple of months as we enter GM season yeah. really around the world, around the league. But, you know, going back to the end of, of 2022, we got a chance to see Jared Stidham for two games, mm -hmm. end of the year, his final two. Uh, what did you kind of take away from what he brought to the table? Obviously, you and Josh have know him really well. You brought him from New England for a reason, but having him a chance to get his first go at this and doing it in kind of a, a real sense, for lack of a better term, what did you take away from his performances? Yeah, well, um, like you said, we've been around him for um, numerous years, but never saw him play four quarters of an NFL game on a Sunday. And that's a big change. There's a lot of guys that um, can perform well in the preseason, uh, perform well in practice, but the Sunday when the lights are on and the speed of the game is what it is, and you have um, an opposing defensive staff that's game planning for you know your team and to stop certain things, it's it's a whole different beast. Mm -hmm. And so there was still there's I mean there was still a lot of unknown even though that we had spent time with him uh, of how he would do in that in that situation. I think the the positive thing that he showed is that he could go in there and on a very basic level he could go in there and move the team. And I think um, there's a lot of, of, of um, quarterbacks that get that opportunity that just struggle with that. They struggle to move the team. And, and a lot of that comes with um, knowing the offensive system, preparation, but also confidence and football intelligence to be able to go out there. And I think what we saw from him is he could go out there and problem solve. 
a little bit. And that's a really hard thing to do is to be able to go out and adjust plays, um, read, uh, understand coverages, make the adjustments to get our uh, to get our team in the right play. And he showed the ability to do that. I think he also showed a lot of uh, you know, poise, moxie, some confidence in the way that he played. Um, you know, he was decisive with the football, whether it was a, a decisive decision to throw the football or pull it and run. Um, and he showed a good, really good competitive spirit and and some arm talent too. Um, there were some you know specific throws that he made in those two games that were good football throws. So I think he showed a lot. I think he showed um, you know a lot of good things, but it is a two game sample. Yeah, and so um, you know you have to temper I- exactly you know. Uh, how high or how low you get um, because it is two games and and you know that's that's not a large body of work to make I would say like you know to have a whole put your fist yeah. down on the table you know exactly what it is type of thing yeah completely and and you know we look ahead now to the draft obviously an exciting couple months for everyone across the league especially in in this building but a different one for you and Josh in a lot of senses right you know second one a little a uh, little experience under your belt but as we sit here now a first round pick in the back pocket. Uh, how does that kind of, I don't know if, I don't want to say change the evaluation or change the process, but it's certainly uh, going to be, if, if things stay the way they are now, a different experience than the first one. Yeah. And and, and everybody focuses on the on the first pick. Um, it's, the, it's the shiny toy, Dave. Yeah. Come on. And, and the thing, uh, um, no, again, I'm not proud. I'm not proud of the fact that we earned the seventh overall mm-hmm. pick in the draft. Um, that's not where I would prefer for the Las Vegas Raiders to be picking. Um, we want to pick at the end of the first round um, because that meant our season was successful, obviously. But but this is what we earned. Mm-hmm. Um, we earned the seventh pick. And we also have the seventh overall pick subsequently in round two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And there's a lot of value in having you know the top pick one of the top seven picks in each round. So, um, you know, that that gives you a lot more opportunities too. But to answer your question specifically, last year, obviously, we traded the first and second round pick. And so I think there was a segment of players that we knew weren't going to be options for us um, where we were picking in the third round. And so um, there's just going to be a, a greater focus on the top of the draft. There's going to be a greater focus on the players that um, – you know, that everybody sees in the mock drafts and things like that. They, the, like you said, the shiny new toys. Um, a lot of those shiny toys from last year weren't going to be options for mm-hmm. us after we um, move those two picks. And so, um, yeah, we're excited. We're going to have an opportunity to add some good players here uh, in the draft and that hopefully can help the Raiders for years to come. And last one before we get you out of here, the Pro Bowl coming to this facility and Allegiant Stadium in just a few weeks. Three of our guys uh, earned Pro Bowl honors this year, Max, Devontae, and Josh. And, and you know, when you look at the three of them kind of a, as a group, is there a, a common thread that all of them have to ha- you know, for them to be able to produce the types of seasons that they did this year? In a non-like football answer, they're all dogs. Um, that's one thing that all of those guys have. They have a mentality um, when they step on the field, all three of those guys, um, that there is a confidence and an aura about all three of those, mm-hmm. those guys that I'm the best player on the field. And they play like that, and they practice like that, they prepare like that. Um, I'd say the common thread is, is kind of I just hit is their, their competitive spirit. Those guys treat Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday as important as Sunday. There are three of our hardest workers. Every rep is full go. Um, every rep they want to be perfect. Uh, they take care of their bodies. They do the right things when it comes to strength and conditioning. And so they're just so wired and dialed in to being the best um, all week. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do to have that that level of focus and that level of dedication for 17 weeks Every day, there's hey, there's life distractions that come in. I mean, people forget these guys are human beings too. Um, and, and then there's their bodies are sore. Um, there's just the ups and downs of, of of a season, the ups and downs of life. And these guys, these it, these guys block out the noise and they come in to prepare um, like they're playing in a game um, every single time they step out onto the field, and that's what makes those guys great. Yeah, it was funny. I was giving Max a hard time uh, during the preseason one, during one of the preseason games when he didn't play, and he had the eye black on, and he worked up a sweat. And I talked to him after. I said, Max, everyone in that stadium knew you weren't going to be like, do it's part of the process, right? It's part of yeah. staying, you know, being consistent and being, you know, purposeful in how I prepare. Whether I'm going to see the field or not, that's how I need to approach every day, every practice, every game just to be ready to go when the lights come on. Yeah, they're committed to the routine yep. and they're committed to the lifestyle of being great. And it's not for everybody. 
Um, and, and, um, you know, I go down to the cafeteria and, you know, there's, you know, that dessert area and, and I'm usually over there nosing around, but it's like the little things, yeah. those guys, whether it's their diet, whether it's film study, whether it's, like I said, rehab and recovery, um, those three guys are dialed in on it. And, uh, they showed the results this year. All three of those guys had, um, some of their, for a couple of them, their career years. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of dialed in, I know you're going to be dialed in over these next couple of weeks and months. We've taken up enough of your time. So thank you for hanging out. We will see you. I'm Like I said, we will see you a lot, I'm sure, over these next couple of months. And I uh, can't wait. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you.